glory and honor be to the Lamb. And as we stand here, we stand transfixed between the past and the future living here in the present. There are lessons in the past, living in the present, and leading for the future. So as we come to the communion, we're reminded of the lessons of the past. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do show forth the Lord's death that literally took place some 2,000 years ago. And the lessons of what we learn is the most powerful that it becomes a sacrament to us that we celebrate, reminding us of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us, that in our place he died. It's a powerful lesson and that's why we can come before the Father and to worship him. And that's reason as we break this bread right now, the living Lord is with us. And as we look ahead, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do show for the Lord's death till he returns. One glorious day that the crack of a morning Jesus will come back and he will take us home. Until then, we wait for the total redemption of our body, knowing that this is the most powerful truth. Come, let's go into the communion. Let us remind ourselves of what Jesus did and walk down Calvary's road to the cross where Jesus died for you and for me. Amen. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the deep
far away stood an old rugged cross and 2,000 years down together with the church worldwide we take this occasion to celebrate this moment this is the Lord's table this is the cup of the Lord a cup of blessing as often as we eat this bread we're showing forth publicly proclaiming his death but at the same time as we drink of this cup, we drink this cup of blessing. What would have been the cup of dregs and curse he drank, but he gave to us the blessing. Oh, what a privilege it is to come here this morning. And as you participate in this, I want you to realize that let this be a blessing, not only a reminder, but a blessing as we drink of it Receive all of the blessings of Calvary. Receive all of the benefits of the cross. Now, let's lift this cup to say, thank you, Father, for the bread that reminds us of the body of our Lord. And this cup reminds us of his precious blood. We take this moment to thank you as we drink of this cup of blessing and eat of this bread, giving glory to you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. This cup means so much to us, and as we continue to sing, ushers are coming your way to dispose of this cup. Let's just pay attention and concentrate on the Lord this morning and remind ourselves what this old rugged cross means to each one of us and Jesus who died on it. To the old rugged cross I will ever I will ever be true It's shame and reproach gladly bear And he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory for ever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross.
seated. We give glory to God for his great and marvelous love, amazing love, sacrificial love. And we remind ourselves again and again how precious, how precious is the precious blood that saved us. Thanks be to God. If you have the bulletin, it gives you all the information of events that would take place and important news that you need to know. But towards the end, you have notes and it's quite extensive about the how do you know doors are open that's from God. The theme we come from is 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 9. A great and an effectual door is opened unto me even though there are many adversaries. We're now in point number six. We don't need to review all of the other ones. You can have it on the CD or on the Facebook or even in our website. But I want you to go down to number six, and that is talking about forward. So one of the things that we realize is about the open door, it leads us forward, not backward. It leads us in sense of uh, progression, not regression. So beginning with this number six, I want us to turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter three, verse 13 and verse 14. This is what Paul is saying in Philippians chapter three, verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended this, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth for those things that are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Forgetting those things that are behind and pressing for those things that are before towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. In all of our lives, we realize we go through the ups and downs and the vicissitudes of lives. We never know when life will throw us a curveball, but we must be prepared. But nothing should stop us from moving on with God. What do you do with the things that have happened in the past, whether it is good or bad, whether it is pleasant or unpleasant? One of the things we must be able to do is to be able to gather what we can and to be able to burn that keeps us away and to keep moving on. A farmer facing a devastating fire in his orchard was asked by people, now what will you do? The fruits are all fallen. Your favorite trees are all gone. So what will you do? And the farmer said, I will gather the fruits that I can and burn the rest. And then I keep moving on to be the farmer that I've always been called to be. Nothing can keep you from your call Nothing should keep you from your vacation of life. Nothing should keep you from doing all that you could do in terms of spiritual, academic, scholastic, professional, or your well-being, or in terms of your knowledge and understanding. To be able to move on, that's very important. So if you would turn back to Philippians chapter, four, chapter 3 and verse 14, listen. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I don't want you to be floored, but I have 12 points. It's all of them is not in your notes, but we'll be finishing soon. Don't worry. All of them begins with P. So let me just say the first one that you need to underline, or if it's not written, you need to write in your notes, is pressing. Press towards. Press forward. Press towards the mark for the price of the high calling of God, for the mark of the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The first thing we need to understand is an open door will always press us forward. Press towards the mark, never away from the mark. The mark which is 
the high calling. Your calling in your spiritual life is high calling. Your calling in your profession or vocation or academic or studies or in terms of your knowledge and understanding should always bring you forward, press you towards the high calling. It is high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There are times you find people because of some experiences or because of some words refuse to move further. And you find that in the case of disciples, some of them who refuse to go further because of the hard sayings of Jesus, because of the cost of discipleship. So when you turn to John chapter 6 and verse 66, listen to what the gospel writer says. From that time on, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They were like Demas who, who followed after Paul, saw great miracles, and soon the bright lights of Thessalonica literally kept him away and no more preaching the gospel, moved far away. Or it could be like King Saul having gone with such a devout call, lapsed and went back. You know the story of uh, Lord's wife. In Genesis chapter 19 and verse 26, listen to what it says. But his wife looked back from behind him, looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. The moment you don't have momentum, the moment you are not mobile, that very moment, you are a monument, you are no more a movement, you become like a dead salt. So let me just remind you of so many people in the spiritual, academic, or in terms of their life in profession, or in terms of their calling. Having started well like the Galatian church, somehow they fell back. Having started in the spirit, they ended up in the flesh. But you know, it's a sad story. No one needs to turn around. No matter what the past has been, they need to press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There was a preacher who went down in the turn of the last century to the Midwest and into a town that was drunk and ungodly. But there in the saloon where all the people were, outside he began to preach the gospel, and soon people were no more going to the saloon. But they were there uh, in the church. Uh, the saloon soon became a church. There was a mighty revival. But as years passed by, their revival, their spirit, then turned into mediocrity, and you find them no more fervent in the spirit, but holding back, and they thought they were arrived and took things for granted. Rather than press and keep pushing, they just pushed back, pulled back. The preacher did everything he could, and finally he made a plaque, a wooden plaque, and in which he wrote from the book of Proverbs, chapter 29 and verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. And Sunday after Sunday, he began to say, get back into the vision, continue and keep pressing on to the vision and the destiny that God has for you, but they paid no attention. They were satisfied. They were contented. Soon after, the preacher was called elsewhere, and then there was a revival there. But happened to be that a few years later, he was passing through, and so he decided, why not go back? Because the first church was always in his heart and in his mind, and he went back to the saloon, which was a church then, had totally been, totally, completely decayed. There were, looks like there were nobody there. Somehow, things turned around, and there was no more revival. It was simply a monument. People were just coming, a few people, and that was sad. As he sat down and he cried, crying to the Lord, his heart was broken, and he was saying, why, Lord? And the Lord directed him to that plaque that was still there from Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Only the W was not there, it was missing, and so it read, here there is no vision, the people perish. Here there is no vision, the people perish. In order to keep that door open, 
you must be able to have that vision and you must press towards the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Never give up. Never, never give up. Never, never, never give up. Keep pressing on. Let me remind you many a times we have a tendency to look back and look at the past as those glorious days. Those are folks that live in the glory of the yesteryears and they tend to think that the best years have passed by. Never forget, the best years are yet to be. The past, as wonderful as it is, is not completed. You cannot be halfway. You must be able to live expecting the best in your days and better and the best in the coming days. There are times we need to look back only to be able to look forward. There are times we have to look back only that we could look forward. One of the greatest inventions that is found in the automobile is the most expensive and yet the most vital piece of the motor vehicle. In fact, everything else is expensive, but this little thing is not in a paramount expense as the other portion and parts of the car. It is the rear view mirror. You know, the earliest cars that were started out never had a, a rear view mirror. The folks would basically have something holding on to a, a little mirror and they would look back. But apparently it was in 1914 it became a standard because of a man who was racing together with a mechanic at the India Polis uh, 500. But that particular day, he didn't have the mechanic who would sit with him and holding the mirror if he has to look in the back. And so he improvised. What he did was he took the mirror and stuck it up there in the, in the front the glass and uh, he looked and then, of course, history came to be. We have rear view mirrors right up in the front. But have you ever seen someone driving a car looking at the rear view mirror, you can never go forward. You always look ahead, look forward, and drive forward, but there are times you need to look in the rear view mirror to see what happened and what you crossed to enable to help you to keep moving forward. And so we need to understand a very important aspect that we find is that we need to keep pressing. Looking forward, and there are times we look back to enhance the moving experience, always mobile. That brings me to point number two. So keep afresh in your mind. Number one, press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. P, press. Keep pressing, keep pressing. Even spite of the adversaries, a great and effectual door is opened unto me. No matter what the adversaries, I keep pressing forward. Number two is progression. It simply means we are born and our entire life is a story of progression. It simply means a mobility. It simply means a growth. In hate within us is the ability to grow. We are not basically in the world to be a little child. We have to grow to be a young man, a young woman, and then to be matured into men and women. None of us stays in the first grade and continues in the first grade. Something must be wrong. We're meant to keep moving. For those of you who just finished college and schools and graduated, that's not the end of your life. You're only beginning. Sometimes you may feel you know it all, then you understand you're not progressing. You may think you know it better than your teachers and your professors understand this very simply. You are actually going backward. The most important thing for progression is simply you have to grow and you got to learn as much as you could. What is important is that this aspect that we find in the Bible, where the people of Israel camped in Horeb, there's a beautiful history of God reaching out and, and coming to them in Mount Horeb and the laws and all of this uh, wonderful experiences, but they were so satisfied that they never left Horeb, they just camped in Horeb. So when you read Deuteronomy chapter 1 
and verse 6. Listen to what God is saying. And then Moses says, The Lord our God spoke unto us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough in this mountain. You're in this first grade and you love it so much. It's time to pack up and go. Keep progressing. Keep moving. How many people are satisfied with an experience they had about 25 years ago? Oh, I came to the Lord in 1965. My friend, this is 218. 2018. Why are you talking about the testimony? Some churches just want to dwell on just one thing. John chapter 3, verse 16. Born again, born again, and they build a complete friends around it, and all they know is, are you born again? Yes, but let's move on. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, he says, repentance unto dead works, faith unto God, what baptisms and so forth, resurrection of the dead. And then he says, let us go on into perfection, not laying on the foundation. Those are foundation, those are important. But then having the foundation, keep moving on. It must be progressive. Then there are others who moved out from being born again and justified to water baptism. So if you were to go in any Sunday, they're just preaching about water baptism day in and day out. Wonderful as it is, those are foundation. Let's move on. And then there are churches that are stuck on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. They're foundation. But you can't build a fence around it. Move on and let us go on into perfection. There's so much of glorious experience for us to experience from God. Not be stuck and not put a bridge around or put a fence around, but a bridge to further experiences that God has for us. So what is remarkable is when you turn to Numbers chapter 10 and verse 5, listen to this what it says, when you blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east part shall go forward. That's the Levites, that the tribe of Judah. The moment you hear the alarm, there must be those folks on the east side. It tells them to move forward. And when they begin to move, the rest of the camp begins to follow them. If you do not move, you are going backwards. If you do not go forward, you're simply going backward. We need to be progressive. And we need to understand it's part of our life to keep moving, to keep moving, to keep for moving forward. When the camp begins to go forward, it's a sign the rest of the people should be moving arise. And so Moses is saying in Numbers chapter 10 and verse 35 in the same chapter, and it came to pass when the ark set forward, set forward, set forward that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, let your enemies be scattered, let them that hate thee flee before thee. The moment camps begins to move, it is an amazing thing. Arise, the Lord arises, your enemies will be scattered. But there's so many people sitting put in Mount Horeb. There's so many people sitting put in some mountain of experiences, not moving forward, always gloating in their past achievement or the past of success, but meaning nothing today and basically doing nothing today except talk about the past. The Bible simply says, arise. And when the camp moves forward, it's time. We must move forward. It means forward in our spiritual life, from glory to glory, from grace to grace, from strength to strength, from faith to faith, or whether it be in your scholastic academic life, don't just sit down there and say, that's it, I've accomplished everything. No, you haven't, you just started. Yes, you got your diploma hand, but there is still more land to be possessed. Don't be complacent. I want you to understand the sad commentary that you find in the days of the prophet Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 24, listen to the indictment that he makes against the people of Israel. But they hearkened not, nor inclined the ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imaginations of their evil art, and went backward and not forward. They imagined evil. 
They would not listen to the word of God. And what happened? They went backward, not forward. There's a lot of Christians, after many years, they're walking backward rather than forward. And every time you are in a marching army and when people are walking forward and when you walk backward, you are hurting many others apart from yourselves. It's a collateral damage. The army of God would be damaged. The people of God will be damaged because you cannot have a momentum when there are people walking backwards. It's confusion. We must all be stride together walking forward, 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 progressive. It happens not only in spiritual, but also happens in academic life as well. For those of you who have graduated, congratulations. But understand, you have just began. And there's so much to be accomplished. There's so much land to be possessed. There's so much that you need to know and understand. And there's so much God has for you. A young man some 30 years ago, just across in Hillcrest, or Jamaica High actually, in those early days when the computer, well, computer was in its infancy, actually studied that, took photography. Do you know by now he would have been placed in the top of the line in an industry or a CEO of an industry? But after passing, he was so complacent. We don't know what took place, whether the wrong type of friends or, or just some calamity, but he just stayed put, never really expanded, never really progressed and he's stuck there, and even today, as a middle-aged man, he's stuck where he was, having no job, having no vision. What a tragedy. It could happen in your spiritual life. It could happen in your profession. It could happen in, in your knowledge, and so many people think they have it all. It's a village mind, a village mentality. So insidious, so small. Get to know the world, get to know other tradition, get to know languages, get to know people. Don't be stuck in a little world that is so far away. We live in the 21st century and we need to expand our knowledge and young people know so much through so many social and other networks. But I say to you, be careful as you expand this knowledge. I want to say this important aspect that in our spiritual life, we should grow. In fact, when you read the book of Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, he says, but grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace. Yeah, you have been saved 20 years ago, but have you grown in that grace? Yes, you have come to the Lord 10 years ago, but what is the knowledge you have? Yes, I know John chapter 3 and verse 16. Any more? Yes, Revelation chapter 3, 21. Those two and no more. You have not grown in your knowledge of the Lord. Do you know him as Savior? Yes. But do you know him as a healer, as a securer, as the one that is the wonderful uh, person that comes to you in every stage of our, every experience brings a better understanding of who Jesus Christ is. He's more than a Savior. He's more than a Lord. He is still the one that is the Redeemer. He's still the one who is the healer and the sanctifier and the one that is able to take you through. Get to know that. You know, what I like so much is when you turn to the, to the book of Exodus chapter 14 and verse 15, listen to what it says here. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward, that they keep moving forward. It's important we understand this. So number one, let me remind you, it has to do with what would be pressing towards, pressing forward, pressing unto. That is important, pressing there will be obstacles, there will be adversaries, there would even be a lot of enemies that would try to stop you. For every door that is open, understand, the only way it's going to be effectual and the only way it's going to be great is when you confront the enemies and come and press them. It's yours. You need to press right through. It's not going to be a red carpet with everything said, welcome. It simply means the mop-up operation, even though the door is open for you. Number two, it must be progressive. A sense of progression that simply means that this door must always help me to grow and not be stunted. 
not be stagnated. Number three is a very important word, and that simply means pause. Where you are in Exodus chapter 14, if you turn to verse 13, listen, these are the people of Israel. They were stuck between two straits. They were there behind were the Egyptian army led by the Pharaoh coming after them. And then in front of them was the deep blue sea. Basically, that was the Red Sea. Have you been stuck between two thorny places? The enemy led by Satan himself and then on the other side, a wilderness of nothingness or a water, a watery grave. And you do not know what to do. And there are many times that we would think of going back and that's exactly what the people of Israel wanted to do. They wanted to go back to Egypt. The smell of onion becomes so precious. The scent of all the things there in Egypt and the fish and things became stronger. We want to go back. But when God was concerned, you are not going backward. You will always go forward. Then how then do you tackle the situation? How do I go forward? The back of course is Egypt. I don't need to put a white flag and say I'm giving up. No, I'm not going to be a slave under Satan anymore. But then how do I go forward with the Red Sea or the deep blue sea that is in front? What God is saying is pause. Pause for a moment and there comes a time in our life when we are confronted with problems in the front and problems in the back. What do you do? Take a moment to pause. And so it says here, fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of God. So what we need to do is in the midst when we are so torn apart and pressed in and out and completely out, God is saying, stand still, look back and see what God has done. Listen carefully to the voice of God. Stand still. And when you open your eyes, when you pause and to take that moment to seek the Lord, you're going to hear a voice. It's the voice of God that says, stand still and see. I have just seen with my natural eyes. I have seen Pharaoh and all of the horses and the chariots of Egypt coming after me. I've seen Satan and I've seen all the powers of hell bent on knocking me down. What do you see up in the front? A sea of impossibility. A sea of defeatism. A sea of whatever will be. I don't know. But what God is saying is see. The salvation of God. Do you see salvation even in the Red Sea? Do you see salvation in the deep nothingness? What I mean is, it's not what your two eyes in the natural can see. It is what your heart can see with the eyes of faith. That you can say to yourself on the word of God, there is the salvation of God even though it's a Red Sea. I see salvation. I see a job. I see a happy married life. I see a home. I see a house. I see largeness. I see increase. I see growth. In the face of everything that is thrown against you, you are not looking at problems. You are saying God is allowing opportunities to come. A door, a wide door, a great door, an effectual door is opened unto me in spite of of the problems, in spite of Pharaoh and his army, in spite of the Red Sea, I see salvation. Stand still. Stand still. And see, see, see with your eyes of faith the salvation of God. I want you to understand a remarkable thing is when you stand still, you hear what Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 says. It says, trust in the Lord. Lean not into your own understanding. It's a moment of trusting God with all your heart and not leaning to your own understanding to say, Lord, I trust you. I know that you have brought me in such a time as this, not as a mistake, but you are in control. You are sovereign. You alone know what you're doing. I've got to trust you. Give the Lord a clap offering. <laughs> Number four. Let me say this, number one, press. Number two, progression. Number three is what is called a pause. Number four is what I would call a provision. 
there are so many people who say, I do have this uh, vision, I do have hardly any means, but God has called me to start a business. I don't have money. Or God has called me into a high call. I don't have the people and I don't have the people that, uh, you know, knowledge of so many people in high places. I don't have, my friend, you know someone in high places, God himself, and that's what you need to know. One of the things we need to realize is God makes provision if you trust him. When you turn to the same chapter in Exodus chapter 14 and listen to what verse 14 says, listen, the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. One of the things is when we are confronted with problems, uh, our peace begins to shake and, and it looks like the peace is like a jelly that's jumped out and all we have is worry and fear. There are times in our lives when we are going through so much of trial, sometimes uh, love runs out, faith runs out, it looks like it just jumped out of the window. We said, forever I'll love you, but what keeps the marriage, what keeps the home, what keeps our Christian faith is simply trust. Don't let it run out. Everything else will come back, but trust God whether it is night or day, whether you have it or whether you don't have it, whether the trials come or trials don't come, whether there is the sunshine or whether there's the cloud. Trust him at all times. And so know this, that God has made the provision. So it says the Lord shall fight for you. You see, my friend, here is Paul who's saying, I have not much strength, but the Lord is saying, this is a secret, the Lord told Paul, in your weakness, my grace is sufficient. Whatever you lack, I have thrown in enough grace to fill up all what you don't have. My grace is sufficient. God knows how weak we are. God knows so many times uh, we don't have it all together, but God is saying, my grace is sufficient. His provision is awesome. I will fight for you, the Lord says, and you will keep your peace. You don't have to be worried. So as long as you can trust in the Lord, don't let worry and fear control you. Know that God will provide. An old saying says, whom the Lord calls, he equips. Whom the Lord guides, he provides. And certainly, if God has called you to be what you are called to be, a lawyer, a doctor, a sports or whatever it is, no matter how difficult it is, if he's called you, he will equip you, he will also guide you and provide for you. Just trust the Lord. Just trust the Lord. I like what Paul said in the very dire situation he was in the Philipp Philippines, when he writes about this in the letter to the church in Philippi, in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19, he says, but... No matter what is going on, but my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. My God shall supply all my needs, not according to my insufficiency, my inadequacy, but according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now take number five, and this is important. This is what I call position. It's time that you need to understand that no matter how difficult the circumstances, when you know God is opening the door, God equips you, God provides for you, God guides you, but also know that you are in the right position. Even though circumstances may not look right, you are right in the right circumstances. God tells you to do something which only you can do, and God will do only what he can do. But you must first do what you have to do, and it opens the door for God to step in and do only what he can do. When you turn to the same chapter in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 16, listen to what he says. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. You know, my friend, Moses had to exercise his faith. He realizes, of course, God doesn't want them to go back and surrender to the Egypt and be slaves forever again. But God is telling, go forward in spite of the fact it is the deep blue sea, it is the Red Sea forward. But I want you to know what God is saying. I have brought you 
in such a time as this. It's not a mistake. No matter what the past has been, your past actually becomes seeds of what would be divine possibilities. No matter what the past has been, they are seeds of divine possibilities. So here is what would be a position. God is saying there's no mistake. In such a time, I've placed you, I've positioned you. Now position yourself to catapult right through the Red Sea. Even if the sea has to be divided, what should I do? This is the time God says, position yourself. What do you have? It may be a little jar of oil. You don't have to be poor. That little is imp important. What do you have? I just have this degree. What do you have? I have this knowledge that I could cook something good. I have this knowledge that I can stitch something good. Begin with what little you have. Don't compare yourself to big companies and big establishments. Begin with what you have. Everything begins with a little seed. It's a seed, mustard seed faith. But then begin to grow. Begin to progression. Begin to know that this little seed of faith will one day become so powerful that you could say to the mountain, be you removed. So when you come to a situation, what is it that you have, Moses? I just have a rod. What you have is a rod, but the power of God is in what God has given you. So it may be the ability of medical knowledge, of sports knowledge, of engineering possibilities. Begin with what you have. Begin with what God has placed in you, even though little, a rod. So Moses, lift up your rod. Now, what do I do with the rod? Do what you can do. Leave the rest with me. Lift up the rod. You're positioned at this time. You are there with all of the soldiers of Pharaoh and the Pharaoh coming behind you. And here is the deep blue sea, the Red Sea. Now position yourself and lift up the rod that you have and stretch it. What will happen? You don't worry. I will let the Red Sea divide. Until you begin positioning yourself, it will not work. So the most difficult problems that are confronting you could actually become a place of positioning yourself to advancement. Position yourself for progression. Position yourself for advancement, for God has brought you in such a time as this. God has positioned you in this place, in this time, and God knows it. God has positioned you in a difficult situation, in a difficult environment, and God knows it. He's put you there so you can transform that situation and bring a transformation. Because God has given you the ability, the little seed, the little oil, the little rod that's in your hand. Lift it up, and the sea will be divided. And the children of Israel should go on dry ground. Excuse me, what happened to the water? You don't worry about the water. The water is simply going to part and you're going to walk through the sea. How many received their papers in this way? You just had to implicitly trust God. Your first job, the way you met was almost like an amazing moment. In the most difficult moment, God made a way and what a networking. So don't despise the days of small beginnings. It's important you understand that the past could have been terrible. You know what? When you look at the collateral damage, when you think in terms of what took place in the days of Achan, in the book of Judges, chapter 6 and 7, it brought about a collateral damage. In fact, uh, the nation of Israel lost a war. This fighting force... After having gone through Jericho and defeated Jericho and seen the old wall crumble, suddenly lost in a little battle, in a little skirmish called Ahai. Why? Because of one man, Achan, and because of that, his tribe, and because of that, the whole nation paid a terrible collateral damage. And yet, when you go to the book of Hosea, chapter 2 and verse 15, remember the word, Accor. That is the value of Accor, where it happened. But when you turn to Hosea, God is saying, I will allure my people and I will bring them to myself and I will give her vineyards from thence 
and the valley of Akor for a door of hope. Excuse me? The valley of Akor, a place of defeat, a place of the past discouragement, failures, and no matter what, that I will make to be a door of hope. My friend, your past could have been terrible, your past could have been painful, but that also becomes a door of hope. There are many adversaries, but the door is opened. A great door, an effectual door, Paul says, is opened unto me. And what a marvelous way. The gospel went from Asia and all the way to Europe, and then he comes back again. That is God's marvelous grace, but it took a man to be able to say, I'm willing to go out on a limb and to trust God. What little you have, give it to God. What little you have, exercise faith in it and know that God is in control. What I find is number six, and it's very important to understand this number six principle is simply meaning positiveness. Let me just go from number one all the way to number six. Number one is press. Number, number two is progression. Number three is pause. Number four is provision. Number five is position. And number six simply is telling you an aspect of what God is about to do. It is positivity. If you were to turn with me to Numbers, the book of Numbers chapter 14 and verse 24, we are told of Caleb. It says here in, um, in this passage, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went and a seed shall possess it. What is this another spirit? It means a more excellent spirit. You see, my friend, when you go to Numbers chapter 13, you're going to find there were 12 spies that were sent to spy out the land. What did they see? They saw the rich harvest. They brought grapes and they brought all of the fruits. There were too much to carry. They had to have poles and people carrying it. But they also saw something. It so happened they began to see sons of Anakims. They saw the Jebusites. They saw the Amorites. They saw the Moabites. They saw even the Canaanites up on the mountain. They were big. They were mighty. But the sons of Anakim, they were like giants. Exaggeration always making our little molds of problems into mountains of problem and demonizing God and downsizing yourself. And what happened is they came back with reports. This is what we saw. But the Anakims, the sons of Anakims, they were like giants. We were like grasshoppers. You see, my friend, negativity so when you go to chapter 13 of the same passage in Numbers chapter 13 and verse 32, you come across this passage and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched, the land through which we have gone to search. It eats its up inhabitants and all the people we saw in it are men of great stature. You see, my friend, the dangerous thing is what would be a negativity. But I want to bring P into it, Caleb was of different. Caleb had a positivity. Caleb was a man who said, what are you talking about? These are easy bread. God has sent us. They will be wiped away. Don't you look at the stature. Don't you look at the size. Don't you look at how big they are. Understand that God, the big God has got you into his hand and he will raise you up beyond and above your enemies. Just trust God. Now, I want you to understand it's important we understand this principle because it's so important that it simply tells positivity. If you were to mingle with people with negativity, you will be filled with negativity, negativity and murmuring and complaining. But when you walk and fly with birds of positiveness, you will imbibe that positive. You will say, I trust God, because that is what? If you're going for science, get together with people who are science. If you're going for medicine, if you're going into sports, get together with people who are interested in sports. If you're going on to be a minister, get to sit down with pastors and ministers and imbibe this a sense of positiveness because if there's someone negative he will stop you he will impede you 
So it's important that we understand a positivity is an important aspect of an open door that's open that we need to understand that God has placed with us a spirit and we must have a different spirit. Psalms chapter 1 talks about godly and the ungodly man. See the difference between the two. But going on to number 7, it's important we understand a very important principle and this is what is important because you can find in Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 and that is possession. God has given you the land. It must be in your heart. It must be imprinted deep within. You know it comes at a time of calamity. It comes at a time of tragedy. It comes at a time of loss of your job. It comes at a time of the loss of your of your health. It comes at a time when you have had a bad relationship. It comes at a time when everything is shaken in and out. You see when Isaiah went into the temple of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6, hey his uncle Uzziah died and it was in such a time when he went to the temple in the most difficult time he said I saw the Lord and I heard the voice of God who said who shall I send and Isaiah said in honey in Hebrew it simply means sent me I'm yours what an important principle Joshua the Bible tells us after the death of Moses the servant of God the first time it's mentioned death of Moses it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, not God's minister. He had never faced and never gone up to the mountains and seen God, but he always heard about God and all the experience through Moses, and now it comes his turn. And so he's telling in verse 2 again, number 2, Moses, my servant, is there, just so that you understand the calamity, the situation. God is not telling you to, uh, like the ostrich, put your eyes in the sand, realize the reality. Yes, Moses is dead. So what? The God of Moses is still alive. So what? You've gone through a trouble. God is still alive. So what? You had a failure. God is still here. So here is what God is saying. Go over this Jordan. I'm giving you this mantle. In a most difficult time, I'm going to give you this commission. You and all the people under the land which I will give you even to the children of Israel. Verse 3, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon that I have given you. If you take one step, you got one step. If you take 10 steps, you have 10 step possession. If you take 15 steps, you get 15 step possession. If you take a mile, that's yours. If you take 10 miles, it's yours. It's your position. But step in, step out and do what God has called you to do. Don't sit and think all of it. I had a man here in this church, for many years he would air out all the plans and wait for the, for the ravens to pick it up. All he did was talk, talk, talk. The last time I heard, he's trying to do a sort of a driving for Uber or something, never even got to do that. For the longest while, he who had such an experience had lived on welfare simply because, not because he had the ability, because he was afraid to step out all out here and gas and nothing more. He never produced. It's important that all the information, all that dream, all that vision, all what God has placed in you, you got to take the first step and the second step and the third step and you will possess what God has given you. It's one thing to have in your mind. It's another thing to play it out and take the step in possessing the land. Every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon, it's yours. It's got your name written in it. It's your blessing. Give the Lord a clap offering. Number eight, when you look into what the Bible says in verse nine, preparation. When you turn to chapter one of Joshua and verse 11, listen to what he says. Pass through the host, P, and command the people saying, P, prepare you victuals, for within three days you shall pass over this Jordan. Go in and possess the land which God has given to P, possess it. Pass, prepare, possess. Say this together. Pass, prepare, possess. 
So it's a matter of you passing through all that God has given you. Prepare for what you're about to do. And the preparation is everything. And now possess it. It's important we understand this principle because many a people had left opportunities go. You never know when opportunities will come. Every day, every morning say, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day of visitation. This is the day when doors will be open. This is the way I will make my contact. This is the day that things are going to be better because I'm going to prepare. Preparation is the law of attraction. Your heart is waiting and it is a magnet that brings about what you either have faith or either have fear. Fear has attraction. Faith has attraction. Faith brings. And if you're saying, I'm afraid, I'm losing it all, you can write it down, you're losing it all. I'm afraid that I'm going to the poor house. You can write it down. You're going to the poor house. But in the midst of it, you're saying, this is the best day of my life. God has given me such a great opportunity in the midst of adversity. He's opened a door, not just a door, a great and effectual door is opened unto me. And so important we understand this. And now when you come to number nine, Look at what it says in very important tool. Important tool that will propel you. And this is important that will motivate you. And in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, this book of the Lord, this is the word of the Lord. Understand it's not some crazy man or a woman or even a preacher what he says or what he thinks and what he decides you should do. This is your manual. This is the book that should guide you. This book of the Lord shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall, number 10, meditate, ponder, ponder, day in and day out. And what happens when you have the promises of God and when you ponder and think and meditate and speak out the promise of God, for thou shalt make your way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success in your spiritual life, in your scholastic life, in your professional life, in the welfare of your financial life, meditate on this. So let me run through before I close with the last two. Number one, I'm talking about pressing forward. Number two, progression. Number three, it's important we pause, stand still and see the salvation of God. Number four, there is the provision of God that God will provide even though you may not have it all. Number five, it's important that God has positioned you in a, such a time as this and even the door of what would have been a despair, Akor can become door of hope for you. Number six, I want you to understand no matter what the situation, no matter what has happened, be positive. Like this man Caleb, he had a different spirit. Number seven, it's important that we understand that there is a tense of possession and we must be able to possess no matter what. Number eight is so important that we must be in preparation. Number nine, the promises of God. Number 10, ponder so you can have success and prosperity in all that you do. Now I will close with number 11 and number 12. If you turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 24, you have this passage that saddled the horses, the donkey, and she said to a servant, Drive, go forward, slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. Slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. Post haste. 11p, post haste. You know the story. Here is this woman, her husband was older. They were hospitable to the prophet Elisha. So Elisha said to his servant, what can I do in return for all she's done, the favor to me? She's got everything, but she doesn't have a child. Her husband is too old, and she has given up hope. He says to her, next year at this time, you will have a son. And sure enough, next year, 
the same time she had a son it came to pass when he was a young lad he was in the field with his father but something happened to his head and he fell down the father called for his mama and the mama came running held him in his in in her arm and he died the end of your vision the end of your dream the end of whatever because of some calamity you give up curse god and die do you no my friend i want you to understand this no matter what happened is suddenly listen to what she did she called a servant post haste right do not slack don't waste time speed let's go to the presence of god that is there in that prophet i want you to realize three times she was asked is it well with you is it well with your husband is it well with your son she said it is well it is well i want you to realize this very important thing all of us have experienced in our life just about the time we had given up everything calamity after calamity and when we had nothing else to stand upon just trust in god we stood there with shambles of everything like phoenix that that like like things that have burned and we've said everything around is burned around me but then comes a second wind that is deep within it happens that suddenly we begin to be post haste something comes within and say i'm not going to slack i'm not going to sit down and cry why should we sit down and die the four leprous people said let us arise and claim listen my friend they found food and they found more than food not only for them even for the city of samaria in a time when you should give up in a time when you should say enough in a time you throw in the white towel get up because there's a second wind and you're able to say no 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 post it i will speedingly go to the presence of god and no matter what it is the dream of a child the dream and the vision seems to die i know who gave it to me i will go to him post it don't waste time don't waste time don't go circling over go directly there's two ways of reaching your nose you can reach it right right in and i have a hard time or you can go right straight to the very throne room of god give the lord a clap offering i don't mind people running around from preacher to preacher and prophet to prophet my friend you have access to the father to the throne of god go zoom right into the father because he's the one that has given you he will fulfill what he has promised for you listen to what galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 says don't give up but listen he says be not weary in well doing for in due season just in time we shall reap if we faint not and number 11 while the choir is coming number 11 i will close with this i started with pressing on but it's very important i close with perception hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 looking unto jesus he started it all he put me into the earth he's the author do you think he will not finish which he started the lord will perfect that which concerns you my friend if you have fallen in between it's not the lord you gave up you see my friend a ship is sailing from one port to the other port it's important you understand that right in the middle it looks like all is lost but don't give up hope because right there you will sink keep your faith because he who told you to leave port a to port b he will see you through port b in spite of the turbulence in spite of the wind if had to be the lord will come walking on the waves he's going to save you trust him looking unto jesus who will you look at your trouble and be doomed or look at jesus walking through the waters and the troubled waters and saying peace be still and takes you to the other shore 
Keep your eyes upon Jesus. He's the author of our faith. He's the finisher of faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set at the right hand of the throne of God. And he will be with you. Press. Keep pressing. It's important that progression keep progressing. It's important that we understand that no matter what it is, pause, stand still and see the glory of God. It's important we understand all of this till we come to the end. How do I keep it and keep opening the doors and walk in? Keep your eyes upon Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. Because when you do that, it would be like rain that falls upon you. It is a refreshing and you can go on to do what God has called you to do. Amen. Glory. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I believe there's a window of heaven that's opening up right now for you. And there's blessings coming down. Do you agree?
Understand as the word goes out, the Lord is confirming his word with signs, wonders, and miracles. It's raining. It's raining. It's a spiritual rain that is going to revive you, that is going to strengthen you, that is going to apportion the very things that God has for you. Just say, Lord, I receive the gift. I receive the water. I receive the rain. I receive the job because it's you that has given me a door, a great door, a factual door is open unto me in spite of adversaries. I thank you. I'm going to keep pressing on. Thank you, my friends that have watched by way of internet, television, or Facebook. Let me remind you, you could always catch us on Highland Church Facebook or on www.highlandavenuechurch.com. Dot org. You can always watch all of the sequences of our message and our worship. Thank you once again. God bless you as Pastor Hans comes in. <laughs> 